Hey guys, it's Adam signing in again and today I'm tackling the idea of immortality or eternal life. A carrot often dangled to the masses by many religions, including the largest. However, I'll be taking the more interesting, in my view, contrarian perspective on the topic, which is more often than not viewed positively. For the faithful, everlasting life with God in an afterlife is an outcome they can look forward to if they stick to the true path, and this current embodied existence is just merely the means towards their ultimate bliss and justice. And it's a lovely idea, I mean, I, I hope it's true as well, but I just don't think it is. That they may be poor or disabled, or that they may lose their children to disease, abduction, childbirth complications, or even war later on in their lives will be worth it when these injustices are rebalanced and repaid an infinity over in the infinite afterlife. But few actually think beyond this flowery image to the true and downright horrific implications of what they actually long for. When dealing with the infinite or more specifically endless existence I think the old proverb be careful what you wish for has never been more appropriate when considering what's actually at stake. Indeed, even an eternity of the best possible conditions actually devolves into an intolerable torture as it dawns on the immortal mind just what it's brought into. To understand why, or at least feel a fraction of the panic of the aperophobic, we need only consider a few thought experiments to truly help us grasp the enormity of what we're talking about. As I've used the counting examples in a previous talk, I'll outline the timescales we're talking about here to give you some perspective, though not much. The trillion number there looks terrifying enough, yet this number is actually practically nothing on the scale of the upper ends of estimation in some theories as to how the universe itself will end. By the way, on this subject, I highly recommend watching a video called Age of the Universe Time in Perspective, which does a fantastic job in really showing just how huge timescales are on the scale of the life of the universe and the things within it. It's truly mon monumental. I'll, I'll link it in the description and all of these other videos are great as well. So check that channel out, definitely. He visually imagines in that particular video a single second to be a millimetre cubed. So it's a millimetre solid cube which represents a second, which eventually scales up to the entire time of modern human existence being about the size of a small building, which to put in greater perspective compares with the age of the universe itself, some 13.8 billion years at around half a kilometre cubed, so about 0 0.43 I think the exact number is. A vast difference that is later dwarfed by the truly enormous timescales that stretch way beyond the size of not just our planet or even the galaxy, but also the observable universe. Considering all that, just how mind-bendingly colossal these timescales are, now consider they're practically nothing compared with what you'll endure in your immortal existence. But it's not just the timescale itself, or, or rather, the lack of it that's scary. What do you even do with such a time? Assuming you exist after death for a timeless period, surely there'll become a point in that existence where you'll just simply have nothing left to do. We can infer a priori, and based on what we know about existence and the universe, that knowledge, or at least our expression, and thus understanding of it, anyway, has limits. In any given language, and there are a finite number of them, presumably, there will only be so many discernible words and concepts attached to them. When one has read and expressed all there is to read, and to express, and even done so an infinite amount of times, what, what else is there to do? The same process can be applied to experience, generally. To, to my mind, then, existing eternally is like playing your favourite game on God Mode, where there's simply no possibility of your failure, or defeat for that matter. You, you have infinite time, and so 
as long as the possibility of victory in the game is above zero, it's between zero and one, that probability, you, you will win that game, and in every conceivable way, given enough time passing. There come a point when the eternal mind has fought every possible thought and experienced all that there is or can be experienced. And yet, to the mind's perception at least, hardly any time has passed at all with the potentially Googleplexes by Googleplexes worth of time, as measured by us mere mortals, seeming but a little thing, if anything at all. Another digression I strongly urge you to take is to listen to or read the short story The Last Answer by science fiction writer Isaac Asimov, who, who expresses this better than I ever could. Pause now and click the link in the description or above to avoid spoilers. Murray, the main character, is such an unfortunate individual who has to deal with the implications of eternal existence. Also in this story, the end suggests that Murray's jailer and nemesis who he at one stage refers to mistakenly as God, though it's referenced in the tale as simply the voice, is actually a pitiable and tragic character of sorts, despite its evil actions of constraining both Murray and apparently quadrillions of other similar minds to it in Eternal Four. So Murray ends the story with the purpose of destroying the voice, the godlike figure, who has always been conscious of its own eternal existence and finds it just intolerable, doesn't want to go on. Reconsidered in this context then, I, I really can't think of anything worse than not having a definitive end. Any course of eternal existence would become intolerable very quickly. Contrast this with what we know about our bodily existence, and the likelihood that on brain death, we too, at least are conscious and thinking us, or the I within us, ceases to be and I actually feel pretty damn lucky. Please watch my video by the way on eternal oblivion as well and why I think it's thankfully most likely to be true to fully grasp where I'm coming from here. That I am finite is actually not only, dare I say it, a, a blessing when considering the alternative but also gives a measure or meaning to my existence. That I won't exist for long enhances the experience of life and awareness that I have now. It pushes me when conscious of both the infinite and my own mortality towards a more fulfilling life, whatever that may be, however I define it. Indeed, it's precisely because I am finite and fallible that gives my life worth and gives worth both to my time of conscious existence and any so-called achievements that I might accomplish. As Murray says in the Asimov story, to be anything otherwise is worthless. How can he derive any worth or satisfaction from any achievement or original thought, given he has an entire eternity in which to achieve these things? Not only that, any achievement or new thought he could have, the voice itself admits he could have it too. He could have thought of it, which is why Murray eventually fixates on the one thing he works out that the voice can't do and can't think of, which is to destroy it and to end the voice's eternal existence, and thus hopefully end his own. That we do end then is a mark of worth, just as gold or platinum would have zero worth if it was as plentiful as dirt, so too does life derive its meaning and worth precisely from its finitude. So I hope I've given you something to think about today. Thanks for your time once again. Please drop me a like if you feel I deserve it. And I shall see you very soon in the next one. This is Adam signing off.